When my second son was seven, we had a garage sale. In halty, squeaky voice, Adam begged me not to sell his beloved tricycle. But you've grown too big for it, I said, appealing to logic. But I'll grow up, get old, and die, he responded sweetly. And when I'm little again, I'll have my bike. My worldly wisdom collapsed. How did he know about death? Why was he so sure he'd be back? Perhaps the end of life seems so illogical, so discordant, that coming back just seems self-evident. I'd like to live forever. Wouldn't everyone? I really mean it. Could we survive bodily death? Could our personal awareness transcend physical decay? It seems absurd. It seems obvious. Is there life after death? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and I'd really like to know. I start with Stephen Browdy, professor of philosophy at the University of Maryland, who tackles topics others won't touch. He brings new thinking to the quest for survival beyond death. Steve, I, like most, have wondered about the afterlife, not just in a personal sense, but as indicative of what reality is all about. You look for evidence. Is this Realistic. Yeah, I think it's realistic because there are a number of compelling types of evidence, whether it's evidence suggesting reincarnation, whether it's evidence from people who apparently provide communications from deceased friends and relatives. There's also some intriguing new evidence from heart-lung transplant cases where heart-lung recipients take on personality characteristics of the donors of whom they knew nothing. There's a part of me that wants to reject everything that you said immediately. Well... Am I st a stereotypical uh, condition by the science of this world, or what's wrong with me? Well, we, there are probably too many things to go <laughs> into, but as far as I'm concerned, we have a certain range of options when looking at the evidence. There are cases where young children apparently act as if they are reincarnated. There are very intriguing cases where mediums provide very personal uh, bits of information allegedly transmitted by the deceased through them uh, that uh, is later verified by investigators. It's not the normal stuff we see on daytime television, is it? No, no, not at all. The cases are much more interesting than that, and to appreciate that, there's no substitute uh, for actually looking at the evidence. And you've done this? Yes. Extensively? Yes. When we're looking at this apparent body of evidence, we can first of all deal with fraud, misperception, malobservation, hidden memories. It's very easy to rule out malobservation, misreporting, et cetera, et cetera. Then we have what would be appeals to unusual or abnormal processes, like uh, dissociation, as in multiple personality and hypnosis, along with the release of various kinds of latent abilities, which perhaps only emerge in various altered states of consciousness. There's one more non-survivalist option. These would be what I would call super psi explanations. That is, the evidence suggesting survival of bodily death would be explained in terms of psychic functioning among the living that simply simulates evidence for survival of bodily death. So at the end of the day, what are your personal feelings about the existence of an afterlife? There's plenty of data that suggests it. And on my good days or bad days, depending on how you look at it, I'm inclined to think that the evidence is more compelling than not. You'd be comfortable with a world that had the greatest secret, the existence of an afterlife, finding its way to our information and to our knowledge through these uh, odd and isolated sources. That, that, that's fine for your worldview. 
I think it's something that we experience every day. I mean, all sorts of deep truths about the world seem to be understood only by a relatively small number of people. I'm intrigued, but skeptical. Should I smirk and dismiss? I hesitate. Stephen's a trained philosopher and careful researcher. He speculates that super psi can masquerade as survival. A strange subtlety of the paranormal or another absurdity of pseudoscience. I stick with philosophers, this time a skeptic. Michael Tooley, professor of philosophy at the University of Colorado, is a reluctant atheist. He'd rather atheism be false. But he's compelled to conclude it's true. Does he see any hope for survival? I should know how he thinks. Michael, I don't suppose you're any different than I am in hoping that we can somehow live beyond our mortality. Do you think there's a chance? Well, I mean, first of all, uh, I, I share your hope. In fact, I'd like to live forever. But unfortunately, I think it's very unlikely that uh, any such scenario was the case. And yet the vast majority of human beings throughout all history have believed in some kind of afterlife. Oh, quite so. But uh, I think there are sort of two main reasons that people have for thinking there's an afterlife. One is that they think that the mind, so to speak, is an immaterial thing, right? And so they think it's the sort of thing that won't be harmed when the body gets destroyed, right? But on the other hand, I think there's good reason for thinking that immaterial minds don't exist based upon the effects of brain damage and drugs and so on. Sure. The other main reason that people believe in an afterlife is they think that there is a being, so to speak, who's very powerful and very knowledgeable and very good, God, uh, who's going to ensure that we live on forever. And even if we don't have a soul, he's going to, so to speak, collect together the parts of our bodies and, and resurrect us, okay, right? And the problem there is that I think that uh, things like the argument from evil, for example, provide good reasons for thinking that there is no such being. Uh, I think there's excellent reason for believing that humans in general were not specially created, that we have evolved, etc. And so I think that when you look at lower animals and you look at the evolution from lower animals up to human beings, etc., I don't think there's good reason for thinking that we're going to differ in some sort of striking way from them, etc. <laughs> There are many arguments about afterlife. There's uh, spiritism, there's revelation. Uh, so much of this stuff. Do you discount all of it? Yes, in the final analysis, right? But I mean, I, I don't immediately discount it, right? I mean, I, I think it needs to be carefully investigated. But I mean, the thing is that if you look at, at, at spiritualism and so on, right, uh, there's an enormous amount of fraud, right? Magicians like to say that scientists are the easiest people to fool. Yes, I think that's absolutely right, because they're, I mean, they're used to dealing with nature, and nature isn't out to trick them and so on. So cases that have been carefully investigated just don't stand up to examination. No immortal soul, no God, therefore no afterlife. Michael's not happy about it, nor am I, but that's too bad. His reasoning is reasonable. What about his premises? No soul? No God? Can they be so easily rejected? I go to theists. How do they defend life after death? J.P. Moreland, professor of philosophy at Biola University, is a committed Christian. He believes in God and in an immortal soul. I'm sure he believes in an afterlife. I wonder how he argues for it. Well, I think there are certain pieces of evidence that there is an afterlife. The first branch of evidence is theistic dependent. In other words, whether it's reasonable to believe in an afterlife or not depends on whether you also think it's rational to believe in God. Since I think it's rational to believe that God exists, then I have a reason for thinking there's an afterlife. And it would go something like this. 
God is not finished with us in this life. He has projects for us. He values persons because He made them and they bear His image. He is not about to annihilate them or snuff them out of existence. And so God will sustain us in existence because we will always matter to Him whether we want to be with Him or not. The two empirical reasons I have for believing in life after death, the first one is the resurrection of Jesus, if in fact He rose from the dead, based on certain kinds of evidence, then... That's your prototype. Then, then He has gone there and told us about it, and I'm going to listen to what He has to say. The second are, are a, a bevy of near-death experiences where people learn things there is absolutely no way they could know that are impossible to adequately explain through deprivation to the brain of oxygen and various things like that. The theistic dependency, I can accept yes. flat out. Of course, I am imbued with the scientific tradition that everything that, that we are, our memories, our capabilities are resident in the brain. So if you have brain problems, strokes, traumas, injuries, these things can disperse and even disappear. So I see the scientific approach that a continuance beyond mm -hmm. bodily life yes. would be impossible. Well, the truth is there is no scientific approach. There are only scientists who have their own approach. And scientists differ on the question, and they differ as philosophers, not scientists. Because the question of, of whether the mind or consciousness it can exist outside the brain is not a scientific question. Let me dispute the claim that everything can be rooted in the brain. If that's true, there's no free will. Uh, because that means that consciousness is an epiphenomenon. It's a byproduct. It's caused by the brain, but it doesn't in turn cause anything. If that's true, then the acceptance of scientific theories is determined by your brain chemistry. So y your afterlife belief is rooted in your belief that consciousness is real and independent and is a different substance than the brain. The idea that memories in the, are in the brain is absolutely gobbledygook. It makes no sense at all. Uh, it, that's about like saying that the note C weighs 15 pounds. It's a category fallacy. Memories aren't the sorts of things that can be spatially located in a, in a piece of chemistry. Uh, in, any more than sounds are in a record or a, or a CD. And one more thing about this, Robert. If there is an afterlife like I believe, this is a very, very important question. People shouldn't go through life being indifferent to this. They ought to do everything they can to learn about whether there's an afterlife and try to find out what it's like and, and how it informs day-to-day -day life here on Earth. JP has two empirical reasons to believe in an afterlife. The resurrection of Jesus is certainly central to Christianity, but its historicity is subject to debate. As for near-death experiences, there are physiological explanations like oxygen deprivation of the brain. As I see it, for any hope of an afterlife, the only argument that can work, if any can work at all, is that God exists and that God is personal. Nancy Murphy, also a distinguished Christian philosopher, has a radically different view from that of J.P. She denies the soul. When you die, you're dead. But God will resurrect the dead. Nancy is professor at Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, where we meet. Nancy, is there an afterlife? I'm certainly convinced that there is. Why? Well, it comes as a an absolutely essential, central part of the package of my whole Christian tradition. I don't think that I could provide any independent uh, reasons to believe in it, and so it's a matter of providing reasons to accept the tradition as a whole. I believe that those Christians who say that Christians who say that Christianity is really just about how we live our lives in this world, and then you die. I think they've completely missed the point. Easter is the central Christian holiday. It's the celebration of Jesus rising from the dead, and it's the promise that we too will rise from the dead. 
what are your personal speculations about <laughs> what you and I are going to be doing, assuming I'm with you in the afterlife? Oh, we're going to be talking. Uh, Christians have inherited a sort of sterile notion of uh, eternal bliss, uh, sitting on clouds, strumming harps or whatever from uh, both popular culture and Neoplatonism. But my own uh, idea of heaven is it, it comes from conversations like this and also so many dinner conversations I've had where you start a conversation and there's another way that it could branch and so you branch off but you want to continue talking about this and so finally at that point I'd figured out what we were going to do with that infinite amount of time <laughs> in heaven. But I hope we'll be doing more than talking. Oh, well, there's some speculation about that, too, but I don't think I'll go into that here. Why? <laughs> well, I want to hear it. I want to hear it. I, I don't want to talk all the time, and I certainly don't want to listen <laughs> to all those people around the dinner table. I'm not well, going there with you if it's all i got to do is have dinner. Jesus says there'll be no uh, uh, marriage uh, in heaven, and I don't know whether that means uh, we'll be celibate or we'll be... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I like the alternative. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you didn't hear that from me. <laughs> Nancy believes in an afterlife because of her Christian faith. Intellectually honest, she refuses to justify her belief with spurious evidence or weak argument. I like that. As for her speculations, I like those too. But I worry because in Western culture, in my worldview, Judeo-Christian theology dominates. Life after death, even if real, cannot be settled by culture. How about my own tradition, Judaism? I see David Schatz, professor of philosophy at Stern College for Women, Yeshiva University in New York. David's a rabbi. Let me tell you a story about uh, a, a rabbi and a cab driver, both of whom go to heaven. And the cab driver winds up in a more prestigious place in heaven than the rabbi does. So the rabbi asked the cab driver, how did you get into such a ritzy place in heaven? And the, the cab driver says, well, when you do your work, when you ask people to pray, they go to sleep. When I do my work, people pray. <laughs> so that's why I'm in a better place. There are two main views of the afterlife that Judaism has. And then there's also a third, which is kind of more peripheral. The two basic models are immortality and resurrection. What happens in immortality is that the body dies, the soul then leaves the body. The other model is resurrection, meaning the person dies, has sold us something in between death and an event much later in history. But it's called unconscious, the world to come. Uh, for sure. Yeah, well, it's not clear exactly what happens to the soul in between. You can have different, you know, you can say different things. It's, it's still thinking, it's still close to God, or you can just say it's not really doing anything. It's like in a waiting room. But the ultimate afterlife will be the resurrection of the dead, which means the body comes back to life. Uh, of course, it's miraculous since the body had decomposed, but that's a different story. The third model is reincarnation. What's yeah, called in Hebrew, Judaism. Gilgal. We have such an idea, and it's generally found in the mystical sources. But let me focus on immortality and resurrection. What would drive a person to believe in immortality? What would drive the person to believe in resurrection? I think the push towards immortality comes from a couple of things. First of all, it represents a kind of negation of the body. If you believe in resurrection of the dead, then you're putting a certain emphasis on bodily existence because the ultimate end of things is going to be a bodily existence. The philosophers tended to think that the body interferes with the proper role of a person's soul, and therefore they had difficulty conceiving of the ultimate afterlife as being resurrection um, of the dead. Nevertheless, resurrection of the dead is affirmed uh, pretty clearly uh, in the Talmud and the Midrash. The, uh, the sages uh, during those times seem to uh, believe, uh, believe in it. Judaism's vision of an afterlife then does not much differ from that of Islam and Christianity. But congruence offers scant support for the veracity of an afterlife. 
because beliefs of the three religions come from similar sources, including their philosophers in the Middle Ages. How to get at what's real? I'm too old for a term paper in comparative religion, but I'm anxious, concerned I may be ignoring other ways of envisioning an afterlife. I fear personal bias, reflecting my own culture and creed. I should see the Buddhist worldview. I'm pleased to consult Master Fusin Yun, a renowned Chinese monk and founder of a large Buddhist enterprise. He lives in Taiwan, and we connect by teleconference. Is there an ultimate goal of this cycle, this perhaps endless cycle, of birth and death and rebirth? The ultimate goal for Buddhists is to transcend the cycle of birth and death. And so this would lead us to that state of otherworldly existence. And when we talk about this otherworldly view, it would be a state where birth and death no longer exist. And a state where birth and death does not exist is what we call nirvana. You will feel free, and you will feel ease, and you will feel very happy. This is like being in a land of ultimate bliss. Each religion has its own very specific ideas. What is the Buddhist view of life after death? When we talk about afterlives, we can use the example of the chanting beads which the master is wearing. And each of the beads will represent an individual lifetime uh, that they have been through. But while these individual lifetimes may be different from one another, there is something which links these different lifetimes together, which is the thread of karma. And the thread of karma represents the effects of our doings. So what we do will determine our karma. And the karma will determine whether our future life turns out to be good or bad. We need to look at the process of death as a process of changing into a new car, or moving into a new house, or new clothes, or moving into something that is better. So there's no need to be afraid of death. As a scientist, any afterlife seems impossible. As a person, no afterlife seems absurd. Should a being who perceives and desires eternity be denied it? Consider four options. One, I have no life after death. I have no soul. When I become dead, I stay dead. Two, I have a soul, and my soul is immortal. My post-death journey features heaven or hell or some state in between. Three, I have no soul. When I die, I am out of existence. But God, at some future moment in the twinkling of an eye, will resurrect my body and bring back my person. Four, my soul, not God, is preeminent. It is non-physical and immortal and perhaps journeys through cycles of reincarnation. Four options. Only one can be true. Psychokinesis.
As for so-called evidence of an afterlife, I cannot imagine why, if we do survive death, the evidence is so weak. So only if I were sure God exists, would I hold hope for an afterlife. Even then, not with a soul, and not right after death. Only by some kind of, well, reconstitution at some unknown time. I think that's correct. And closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.